And I turn these lights off because that ballast is buzzing and it's driving me nuts. I don't know if it bothers anyone else, but it bothers me. So I'll try to get that fixed this week. <laughs> Please turn with me in your Bibles this morning to Matthew chapter 5. And we'll be studying through chapters 5, 6, and 7, Lord willing, this morning. For those of you who uh, came in late, there are copies of um, last Sunday's message on the front up here. There's three pages from last week and two from the week before. And uh, Lord willing, I'll try to get these out to you uh, one at a time as we go through. We are hopefully getting to know Christ better. That's my purpose in sharing with you uh, from the Gospels. And it certainly can't hurt us to go back over the words of the Lord Jesus Christ and to draw near and to uh, bow the knee like Mary of uh, Bethany did and listen quietly and openly. Our purpose this morning is to go through what is known as the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount in Matthews 5, 6, and 7. This is the first sermon recorded in the book of Matthew. In fact, it's the ser first sermon in the whole New Testament. And Jesus preached it as He was sitting in a mountain or yeah, sitting down up on the, above a plateau up in uh, Galilee. And uh, He was preaching directly to His disciples and there was quite a crowd of people there as well. We'd like to uh, go through this to see what Jesus publicly taught right at the outset of His ministry about the kingdom and about himself as the king. And we'd like to draw a few conclusions about that a little bit later on in the message this morning. Just to review for about two minutes uh, the differences between the Gospels. Can any of you remember, I'd like some feedback, what the differences between Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are? Can anyone remember a difference between these four Gospels? Wes? All right, each one of the Gospels presents Christ in a different way. Can you tell me? All right, Matthew presents Christ as the king. Who does Mark present him like? A servant. Good. Luke presents him as the perfect man. And John, the fourth writer, presents him as God. The Son of God is interpreted by the Jews as being God himself. So... We have four very different perspectives of the Lord Jesus Christ. We know that the four gospel writers wrote as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, it's God's design that we have four different viewpoints of Christ. It takes all of these together for us to understand what Jesus Christ really was like. If we're going to know Him, we have to realize that He was a sovereign subject. That is, king and a servant. He was the very king of the universe, but he was subject to his father. Right? Exalted and humiliated by choice. The same thing goes in our lives. We are exalted. The Bible tells us that as God's people, those of us who have trusted in Christ, we are seated in heavenly places with Christ. And he's on the throne. And yet, we are to walk in humility and submission and in obedience, willingly allowing him to be the Lord of our lives. Christ in uh, Luke and John is described as being man and God. These are real paradoxes. And uh, there's a tremendous amount of truth to be learned in, in, in going through these Gospels and learning from them each one. Well, that's enough just to review the key point that the Gospels are important. They are God's message to us about Jesus Christ. Since none of us have met Jesus Christ face to face, there's no better way to know about Him than to read in the Gospels. This ought to be one of our supreme goals in life, is to get to know the Lord. And in the, in the weeks ahead, as we work our way through some key sections in the book of Matthew, all of these things are going to revolve around the, ter the theme of Christ's kingship. Well, when I think of a king, I think of a politician. It's a peculiar kind of a politician. We don't have all that many kings in our world today. Well, at least we don't rub shoulders with him. But 
a king is a politician. And as a politician, Jesus was standing forth here publicly early in his ministry, and he was declaring his platform. Now, I understand in the States next year is election, right? And they're going through all the rigmarole of, uh, you know, presenting their platforms. And you understand what I mean by the term platform, right? It's something on which you stand, and the, and the metaphysical term is, is related to a physical term. A, a physical platform is something that you stand on. A political platform is a series of promises or declarations of belief or whatever that the administration that is elected is supposed to stand on. Right? Now, politicians don't always keep their promises in their political platforms. But Jesus Christ in Matthew 5, 6, and 7 is basically giving us his platform. If you want to find out what kind of a king Jesus Christ was, what kind of a kingdom he presides over, or will preside over, or both, well, this is a good place to start. This Sermon on the Mount uh, has been called by some the Sermon on the Plain. Luke chapter 6 gives us another account of it, but it, there's really no contradiction. The people were on the plain, and Jesus was on the mountain, and He was preaching, and they were listening. So, you know, it's easy for us to uh, put these things together. It's very probable, as some people have commented, that the teachings that Jesus gave that are recorded in Matthew's five, Matthew chapters 5 through 7 were teachings that he consistently repeated in the early years of his in the early year of his ministry. So it's not improbable that he could have preached this message other times as well. So there's not necessarily a contradiction as some have supposed between Matthew and Luke. Well, Mr. McDonald uh, from California says that uh, this Sermon on the Mount really is, quote, the constitution of Christ's kingdom. This is really the, the breakdown. And if you go through with me, and we hope to scan these chapters this morning, you'll find that Jesus Christ nine times in these three chapters refers to His kingdom. The first time is in chapter 5, verse 3. He says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Verse 6, blessed are they, no, not verse 6, verse 10. Blessed are they who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And in verse 19 and 20, whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Verse 20, except your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. And these are just a few of the references, just to show you that this is exactly what Jesus was talking about. He was talking about the kingdom. And he was comparing the kingdom to earth and hell. He talks about hell in this message. He talks about people that merely live on an earthly realm. And he contrasts what he preaches and what he presides over as being a heavenly, as being a spiritual, as being a kingdom of heaven. Now this subject of kingdom and Christ the King is a very, very much contra um, argued over doctrine. There is a lot of disagreement among Christians about what this really is all about. This is a major issue, has been down through the years of the church. There are two major positions among Bible-believing Christians today on the meaning uh, of the kingdom. Um, questions like, what is Christ's kingdom? If you were to tell somebody what Christ's kingdom is, we'd probably get 40 or 50 different answers this morning. All right. What is Christ's kingdom? What kind of a king is Christ? These are vital questions, especially you know, from the Jewish perspective, the people that were living in Christ's time, they were looking for a deliverer. They lived in an oppressed country, in an uh, oppressed society. If we lived in Guatemala and, and uh, El Salvador and Honduras today and Mexico and in other parts of the world, Afghanistan, where people are being severely oppressed, our expectancy, our desire for Christ's 
guidance in our lives would probably be a, be a whole lot more different than it is today in, in, in our society. There are people that are looking for literal spiritual deliverance, uh, literal physical deliverance. Well, the nature of the king is a, is a vital question. When and where and how and over whom Christ will reign or does reign are other questions that Christians will give you different answers to. The two major positions among Bible-believing Christians, and that's a key point, among Bible-believing Christians, Roman Catholics, I do not consider to be Bible-believing Christians. And yet they have a very definite view of the kingdom of God. They believe that the Catholic Church is God's kingdom. That's why they are enmeshed in political activities. That's why the Roman Catholics lobbied for years and years to become the only religious organization in the world that has a, an ambassador, an official ambassador from the United States. You know, they, they view themselves as establishing God's kingdom on earth. And that's why they took up the sword against, uh, one of the reasons why they took up the swords uh, in, uh, in medieval times, in the Middle Ages, uh, to fight against Islam. You know, they were fighting for kingdoms. They actually established, uh, the Roman Catholic institution actually established the kingdom of, the Latin kingdom of Constantinople and the kingdom of Jerusalem back in 1199 and, and, and so forth. They have always been and continue to be politically oriented. But we're talking about Bible-believing Christians have two different viewpoints. One is that Christ's kingdom is a spiritual kingdom, that we are part of Christ's kingdom today, and that there is no sense looking forward or expecting that Christ will come back out of heaven someday and rule and reign on this earth in a literal way, actually be king in Israel. <coughs> that's one very common viewpoint. Thousands of Christians, probably that's the dominant viewpoint, in the Christian world today. The other viewpoint which I hold and which you are taught here at Northland is that Christ's kingdom is a spiritual kingdom. We are part of Christ's kingdom, the kingdom of heaven. That does not mean, however, that Christ will not someday come back in glory and power bodily and set this world right and reign in righteousness for a thousand years. Now that's there are similarities between those views, but there are great differences. The first view doesn't make a whole lot of difference between Israel and the church. And that's why you will find some editions of Bibles that will mention the church back in the Old Testament. They'll, write, they'll say that this psalm is praises of the church, and they'll have predictions and prophecies, and they'll put notes in the Bible and say this is um, for the church. And if you have a Bible like that, well, you can um, beware you know that that's a, that's a view that's the other viewpoint than what you are being taught anyways uh, this comes out in our hymns you know onward Christian soldiers and uh, bringing in the kingdom and uh, there are lots of hymns that are very much oriented to the church simply fulfilling all uh, experiencing all the prophecies that uh, were given to Israel in the Old Testament I believe that there are great differences. In the uh, Schofield notes between the Old and the New Testament, there is a comment on page 988 I'd just like to read. Christ is never called, this editor writes, Christ is never called king of the church. Quote, unquote, the king is indeed one of his divine titles, and the church joins Israel in the Old Testament in exalting the king eternal, immortal, and invisible. Paul said that in 1 Timothy. The church is to reign under him. The Holy Spirit is now calling out not the subjects, but the co-heirs and co-rulers of the kingdom. In the Gospels, primary interpretation should be distinguished from moral application. Much in the Gospels that belongs in strict interpretation to the Jews or the kingdom is yet such a revelation of the mind of God and is so based on eternal principles as to have a moral application to the people of God, whatever their dispensational position. It is always true that the pure in heart are happy because they see God and that woe is the portion of religious formalists, whether they are under law or grace. Now the point that the editor is making there, in simple terms, 
is that there are two things that you've always got to remember when you're studying the Gospels. And this, what's, this is one of the things that makes the Gospels very complex. And that is that it wasn't written to us. It wasn't spoken to us. I am not sitting on the plain below Jesus this morning and listening to Him preach what has come to be known down in the history of the church as the Sermon on the Mount. We're not there. We're in Ontario. We're not down in Palestine. This isn't being spoken to us, is it? In the 20th century. It was spoken 20 centuries ago. Right? So we must distinguish between what was said to other people and what is written to the church. And of course, Paul wrote to Christians like ourselves, and so that's why we can take some of the other stuff more directly. However, to that we add a second observation, and that is Christ is still Christ. He's still Lord, King, Head, Sovereign, whatever you want to call Him. He's called the Head of the Church. He's the King of Israel. And there's a similarity between those two terms, is there not? A Sovereign and a King and a Lord and a Head are all in a position of authority. And so that hasn't changed. Likewise, we are to be subject to the authority that God has over us, and as He's revealed it through the apostles in the, in the church. So, what this all boils down to is that I believe we can go to the Sermon on the Mount and we can see what kind of a King Christ is, and we can expect that someday He's going to come back and He is going to reign, but... That doesn't mean that there isn't something that we can learn from the Kingdom of the Mount. It'll tell us an awful lot about Christ, of real personal value to us today. In the book of Matthew, uh, the Sermon on the Mount begins in chapter 5. The first four chapters lead us up and tell us very important things. And I'll just breeze through that quickly. Chapter 1 shows us the king's royal legitimacy, that he's descended from David. It also shows us the king's reality, that he actually was born physically and that he came, as the prophet said. Chapter 2, which tells us about his flight to Egypt and so forth, shows how the king was preserved by God from, the, from Herod. Chapter 3 shows us, through telling us about John the Baptist and Christ's baptism, it shows us that Christ is unique, that he has a unique relationship to the Trinity. The Father spoke from heaven, the Son was baptized in the water, and the Spirit came down like a dove. And Christ will judge, and so forth. Christ is unique. No other human being ever had a forerunner like John. In chapter 4, just prior to this sermon that Jesus has given to us, Christ is taken into the desert for 40 days and severely tested, and we find Him ministering and doing His first miracles. This shows us the King's authority and power. And so now, when we come to the fifth chapter, we have the king's constitution. And it follows along, doesn't it? What Christ is now preaching tells us what he really believes and what he considers important in his kingdom. So let's work our way through some of the things in, in uh, Matthew 5-7. through 7. I believe that Jesus' sermon had four parts. And I'll use some of the traditional terminologies just so that you can follow along in your Bibles easier. The first 12 verses have what are known as the Beatitudes. Beatitudes. Now, you probably all heard that there were Beatitudes in the Bible and you never knew what a Beatitude was, right? What's a Beatitude? That is a weird word. Basically, it's a statement of blessing a declaration that good is going to come on somebody. And if you will notice, as Jesus goes through these Beatitudes, He is talking about different kinds of people. He's talking about, verse 3, the poor and the spirit. Verse 4, those, those that mourn. Verse 5, the meek. Verse 6, those that do hunger and thirst after righteousness. Verse 7, the merciful. And verse 8, the pure in heart. Verse 9, peacemakers. Verse 10, those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. And then in verses 11 and 12, he changes to you. And of course, we know from that that he is speaking directly to his immediate disciples, his followers. Right? So we have a list of eight or nine groups of individuals. By the way, do we have any rich people mentioned there? Famous? Mighty? Noble? Noble? 
we have uh, we have people that are persecuted and uh, put down. We have people that normally are oppressed by ordinary kingdoms. But in Christ's kingdom, about which He is speaking, these are the subjects of His kingdom. These are the people with whom Christ deals. Now this morning, I contemplated beginning my message by asking you how many of you consider yourself to be members of Christ's kingdom. And I wanted to have a show of hands. I think most of us in this room would like to believe that we are part of God's kingdom, that we are sub His subjects, that we are really under His authority and that we are following Him. The fact of the matter is that there are a lot of people outside of the kingdom. You're either in or you're out. You either belong or you don't. Christ either is or isn't your Lord. And what Jesus was talking about here has to be taken primarily from in the sense of a person that has already put their faith in Him and is uh, trusting Him. Nowhere in this uh, chapter does Jesus Christ, um, or in, in this message, does Jesus Christ actually come out and, and, uh, and say that you have to trust in Me to become part of My kingdom. But we know that from later teaching that He gave. For instance, in John chapter 3, Jesus said, except you be born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Except you be born of water and of the Spirit, you cannot enter into the kingdom of God. He told that to Nicodemus. Well, most of what is, if not all of what we find here, is really written for Christians or people like Christians. There were many godly people back in Jesus' day prior to the beginnings of the church uh, and they were repentant. They were believers in their hearts. And so, to these people, it was His disciples and to His followers that Jesus said, this is what you need as My subjects. So the Beatitudes are declared by Jesus. They are statements of blessing to those who are truly the subjects, truly followers. And He offers blessing. Isn't it? The, the problem is that there are some people that claim to be Christians that... Um, don't recognize that they are poor in spirit. There are some that do not mourn for their sin. Uh, there are some Christians that never know what it means to sacrifice and to be deprived and to carry their cross, and there's no mourning, and there will be no comforting either. There are many that in so-called in the kingdom of God today who are meek, who are not meek. They're proud. And, and according to Christ's teaching, they're not part of His kingdom. They won't be blessed. Do you hunger and thirst after righteousness? With all your being, do you wish to do right? Do you wish to see right done? Do you work and have a, a, a personal involvement in making certain that other people do right? Do you cooperate in doing right? If that's the way you are, if that's an attitude that has come to you since you've come to know Jesus Christ, then you will be blessed. These are promises that Jesus made. See, and they're of tremendous value. There's a lot of things that you can meditate on. Um, Jesus said, Blessed are you when men shall revile you. Most of us don't consider it a blessing. But Jesus went on to explain, Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, because they did this to the prophets. Well, the Beatitudes have to do with the subjects of the kingdom. In verses 13 to 16, a short section immediately following, Jesus' second main point was this, what are known as the similitudes. The Beatitudes and then the similitudes. And they are well named because a simile is a figure of speech where two things are likened together. One thing is compared to another thing and they're said to be similar. So that's where you get the words similitudes. Well, Jesus likens his, the subjects of his kingdom... He likens His followers to the salt of the world. He likens them to the light of a world. He likens them to a brightly lit city sitting on top of a hill. From whence we get this little ditty, this little light of mine. <clears throat> I'll get that right. This little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. See? That's where this is taken from. Right? He likens... Um, well, anyway, you see the point. Jesus... <clears throat> 
Beatitudes were statements of blessings on the subject of the kingdom. In verses 13 to 16, the similitudes show us the spiritual objectives of the kingdom. What were all these things here for? Why does he say we're to be like salt and to be like light? Why does he say that? Well, he plainly says in verse 16, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. Secondly, and that they may glorify your Father who is in heaven. There's two things here that, that are the basic two. You know, the scriptures have basic numbers. When I think of two, I think of the two great commandments, right? Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. That's the second one. And the first one is love God with all your heart, right? Men, your, your relationship to men and your relationship to God. Here he brings it down again to two. He says the reason uh, God, his, I'll start again. We who are parts of God's kingdom, members of the kingdom, the subjects, we are to be like this so that ultimately two things will come out of it. These are the objectives. They're spiritual objectives. We're not trying to overthrow the Democratic Party in the United States or to set up a theocratic government in Canada or to overthrow the Russians in, in the Soviet Union. That's not the job of the church. The objectives of people in Christ's kingdom are spiritual have a good testimony to people and to make sure God gets the glory He deserves. Now, boy, is this ever blown out and misunderstood. This is one of the reasons, by the way, why Jesus Christ was put on the cross. And they mocked Him by putting a title over His head which said, The King of the Jews. That was a mock. Because they didn't want that kind of a king. They spit at Him and laughed at Him. They wanted to deliver a political revolutionary to deliver them from the oppressor, the Romans. See, that was one of the reasons they crucified Christ. Well, we're beginning to learn about Christ here. We're beginning to see that the Christ of the kingdom of the book of Matthew, which is presenting to us the first major photograph of Jesus Christ, is no mere political savior. He's no revolutionary. He's a spiritual revolutionary, if you will. He's a spiritual king. He requires his subjects to have hearts of meekness and righteousness and honesty and purity. He requires his subjects to have spiritual objectives, to, have, to worry about their testimony to other people and to make sure God gets the glory. We go on at verse 17, and this is the major portion of Jesus' sermon. Most of the time, when Jesus was preaching this sermon, He was talking about contrasts. We have beatitudes, similitudes, and contrasts. The beatitudes had to do with the subjects of the kingdom. The similitudes have to do with the spiritual objectives of the kingdom. And going right into the sixth verse of chapter 7, most of chapter 5, all of chapter 6, and the first part of chapter 7 are contrasts that Jesus drew that emphasize the standards of his kingdom, the real legal principles. Now, I wish I could put this down on the board, but I don't have my chalk and I don't want to take the time to write it down. But I would like you to notice that Jesus was born 2,000 years ago, right? Paul tells us in Galatians chapter 4 that Jesus Christ was born under the law to redeem them that were under the law, right? He was born into a society that had its own customs its own social fabric, its own laws. Right? Now, within that society, Jesus stands up as the light of the world, as the King of the Jews. He begins to preach. And He begins to declare that these people have it all wrong. They claim to have been descendants of Moses. They claim to be teachers and prophets of the Torah, God's revelation to men, but they've screwed it all up. They've twisted it. They've missed the point. By the way, it's no different today. There are, There is preacher after preacher this morning standing behind a pulpit doing exactly what I'm doing, preaching. But they're all in one of two categories. They're either preaching what God actually says or they're preaching something that men have said about it. 
It's a big difference. What we have is the traditions of man opposed to God's true spiritual intent of His Word. What Jesus intended to prove comes out in the very first verse of, of this section. In verse, verse 17 of chapter 5, He says, Do not think that I am come to destroy God's law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. And He meant by that to show them that, it was a, that there was nothing wrong with Moses', wrong with Moses law. But it, it was a spiritual thing. The Apostle Paul, writing the book of Romans in the seventh chapter, says, look at God's law is good. There's nothing wrong with the, the Scriptures. There's nothing wrong with the Old Testament. All those commandments are wonderful. God revealed it. If God said it, it's not bad. The problem is that we can't live it. The problem is with us, not God's law. And Jesus was stressing that the Jewish interpretation in His day by the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Herodians, and other people of God's Word it was skewed. It was twisted. They, they missed the point. Well, these, the contrast that Jesus draws, there are about 14 of them, 14 major contrasts in, in, as we go through chapter 5 and 6 and 7, have to do with three different main areas. There are... Um, Social duties mentioned in chapter 5. In chapter 6, there are religious observances. And in the end of chapter 6 and the beginning of chapter 7, he deals with personal values. I wish I could spend all my time on this part this morning because this is so... There's so much to learn. There's so much to tell us about what kind of a king Jesus really was, what kind of a kingdom he really has. In verses 17 to 20, Jesus... Read it today or sometime this week. Jesus was comparing Himself to the Pharisees. We already read verse 20. He says, You've got, Your righteousness has to exceed that of the Pharisees. Basically, what the contrast Jesus was drawing was this. That the Pharisees looked for ways to get out from under some of the laws. Jesus said, What you ought to be doing is trying to submit to it. Verse 19. But whosoever shall do and teach them the laws, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Some people were trying to get out from underneath them, and some of them, and Jesus said, What you've really got to do is try to obey God's word. In verses 17 to 20, or 21 to 26, he talks about murder and homicide. Under the old law, the entire focus was on if you cut somebody's hand or head off. Right? Or if you killed somebody in anger. The law had prescriptions for that. But Jesus said, But I say unto you that there's more to it than that. The law wasn't intended merely to punish the actual murderers. It was intended to do away with uh, anger and wrath and slander and grudges, which are the inner expressions of the outward act of murder. There's really no difference except that one is visible and the other is invisible. So he con contrasted the two, and Jesus' standard was much higher. In verses 27 to 32, he goes to one of the other Ten Commandments, and he, says, he quotes, uh, Thou shalt not commit adultery. And he says, You people say this. You, know, you have a very uh, limited view of this. In Jesus' day, there were two basic viewpoints on the subject of divorce and remarriage and adultery. There was a liberal school which said that the Old Testament taught that you could divorce for any any old reason, right? Just like today, you know, uh, no fault divorce, basically, right? The other viewpoint was, uh, and he corroborated the other viewpoint. He says, there, if there is room for divorce, it's for only one occasion. But he went on and said, but there's more to this business of divorce and adultery than just the act. He says, I say unto you, if you just look, you've done the same thing. Right? And so, the old law was anti-adultery and pro-divorce. Jesus teaching was against adultery and against lasciviousness and against divorce. All three. The young people watched a uh, film this uh, last Friday by a fellow with youth 
with a mission. Dean Sherman was his name, and he defines lasciviousness and concupiscence and sensuality and fornication. Do you remember the definitions? Let me just give you his definitions for lasciviousness and concupiscence, which are other New Testament words for looking after a woman or looking after a man and, and going through those motions. He says, lasciviousness is stirring up within yourself or other people desires that cannot be satisfied within God's limits. It's just letting yourself go. Concupiscence is an abnormally strong desire or sexual appetite. That is, hung up or preoccupied in the subject of sex. And what Jesus is referring to hits right at the basis of what most of us struggle with. <laughs> you know, most men are concupiscent according to the teaching of God's Word. It's wrong. The law is not given just to keep people from going through an act, a physical act. It's given to change us from the inside out and make us clean, the pure in heart and mind. In verses uh, 33 to 37, Jesus com makes another comparison. The old law was um, against oath-breaking. In the Old Testament, if you made an oath, you weren't supposed to break your promise. Right? It was, I was against the law of God. Jesus went on and, and accommodated that. He said, yes, it's, it's not right to break your promises. In fact, you shouldn't even take an oath. So Jesus wasn't just anti-oath breaking. He was anti-oath taking. He boils down to, to something that the Apostle Paul quoted in 2 Corinthians, by the way. Chapter 1, you young people that are studying 2 Corinthians. Paul says, let your communication be yea, yea, nay, nay, for whatever is more than these comes of evil. What does that mean? Simply put, it means whatever you say, mean it and do it. If you tell somebody yes, then mean yes and act accordingly and don't ever change. See? So, Jesus' standard is much higher. In uh, 38 to 42, the old law said an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And the Pharisees were past masters at executing this. Remember the day they brought this woman that was caught in adultery to Jesus? And they said, she ought to be stoned. And Jesus uh, forgave her. He was, showed mercy and grace to her. But in the process, I think what he did is he wrote the names of all those guys that were guilty of the same thing in private in the sand. And they all went away, one by one, starting at the eldest, it says, and going to the youngest. How did Jesus know which was the oldest and which was the youngest? Why did they all leave in shame without casting the first stone? They were all guilty. He proved their guilt. Right? It must have been a fascinating thing to see. But Jesus uh, showed that there was, well, mercy. The old law said eye for an eye. It was pro-vengeance. Jesus' law was pro-passivism. There's nothing wrong with pacifism. It's wrong to fight. It's wrong to be a striker. Jesus said it's better to give and to go and to let go and to turn the other cheek. Now that still applies. Did you know that? If anybody in the Bible demonstrated the attitude towards persecution by enemies, it was Christ. There was probably never been a society any worse than the Roman society was, as far as injustice goes. Jesus was put on the cross unjustly. He went through several unjust trials. He was unjustly accused by his own countrymen. He didn't go wild and take all the recourse that was due to him. He kept silent and took it. He suffered quietly. And he is his example, Peter tells us in 1 Peter chapter 2, is given to us for an example. It reminds me of um, the testimony of Otto Koenig that I recently heard some of again. He, he uh, is the author of the Pineapple Story. He was a missionary in, in the Philippines a few years back. Some of you might have heard that. It's a fascinating. We've got the tape in there, and you will, you will laugh and cry. And, and praise God, listen to that. You ought to, everybody in this room ought to listen to the pineapple story. What a wonderful thing. But talk about uh, pro-pacifism and anti-vengeance. Uh, 
this fellow's uh, this fellow planted pineapples so that uh, he could uh, raise money and feed himself and get vitamin C for his little girls and the, and all these people down there used to steal his pineapples, and he he became known as the missionary with a long nose, which was their terminology for the angry missionary. Always had a long nose, uh, angry missionary, and he, and he his ministry was completely stultified. He couldn't win them over to Christ. It was only when he turned his pineapples over to the Lord and said, okay, those are the Lord's pineapples and I'm not going to worry about it. Go ahead and steal them. They're the Lord's, not mine. That he began to make breakthroughs. And instead of being the angry missionary, now he became the good missionary to the natives because they could steal his pineapples and also go to his store and everything else. And uh, it showed the proper attitude. Well, we've only gone through some of these. The point of this, this whole message is... Um, is that what Jesus was doing was pronouncing blessing on the subject of His kingdom who are the poor in heart. It reminds me of the Apostle Paul. He says, not many mighty, not many noble, not many wise and strong and learned you know, are, are called by God in the true kingdom. There are ordinary people like you and me. Right? There might be some of the other kind too, but they've got to go through the same process of repentance and faith just like all of us peons. Right? So that's what the, the blessing comes on the, on, the, on the lowly in God's kingdom. And these very lowly people are upheld. Up before the lowly subjects of Christ's kingdom are upheld, these grand, two, eternal, or, or all through time, the ever-abiding objectives, spiritual objectives of maintaining a wonderful testimony before men and honoring and worshiping and glorifying God. The contrast that Jesus brings forth here to show His standards is that His standard isn't just some letter, um, letteristic or literal, um, mechanistic interpretation of the Bible. It's not, uh, oh, the Bible says you can't do this kind of an attitude. But it's from the heart. We should want to do what God says and we should seek to... Uh, fulfill the spirit and not just the letter of the law. And Jesus gave over a dozen comparisons to show that uh, instead of... Uh, you know what? The, he went on in chapter 6 and, and said, you know what the Pharisees do? And the people were well aware of it. They used to give their money, but before they gave their money, they would go down through Main Street and blow a trumpet so that all eyes were attracted to the noise in the marketplace and they'd stand off and <laughs> clang into the... Bo into the steel box went with their with their money. He actually says, don't do it with a trumpet, do it in private. If you're going to pray, don't stand in the corner where everybody can see you and has to walk around you. Pray in your closet in your house. You know, the spirit of this whole thing isn't to get recognition from people. You're doing, you have a relationship with God. These were the um, religious observances. We've read some of the social duties, the personal values. Boy, does he ever come down hard on materialism? I think maybe what we should do is cut this off and continue it next week because there's too much and, I, and it needs to be said. So that's what we'll do. Okay. Dear Lord, we thank You for Your Word and we thank You that You have chosen us, the, um, the poor in heart and the lowly. We thank You that You identified with sinners. You came to seek and to save the lost. We thank You that You have exalted us and given us uh, real value and importance. Dear Lord, we, we love You for sending Your Son. We thank You that He is not some despot, some high and mighty king that uh, rides roughshod over his, uh, his subjects, but He Himself walked with them and ate with them and talked with them and loved them and was merciful to them and explained to them how they could maintain a walk with You. Dear Lord, help us to think this week about our own 